All right, welcome back. So, yes, we'll be talking about uh, some associated attendant uh, issues that have come up as a result of this. We've got uh, two gentlemen joining us this morning. Uh, Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed is a National Incident Manager, PTF on COVID-19, joining us from our studios in Abuja. We also do have uh, Dr. Riyad Mohammed, who is a consultant, family physician, and field epidemiologist, who joins us from Zanfar Vazum. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, um, Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed, let me start with you uh, on this one. Well, I, I know you may have seen some of those information that's making the rounds about some countries uh, that have at the moment just said, okay, hold on, we're suspending this for a bit as a result of the effects, uh, the results that we are getting. So uh, what is government's thinking or what is your thinking having seen that now? Uh, good morning, Chamberlain. <clears throat> um, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me on this program. Uh, I think in the last 24 hours, we have received this uh, uh, disturbing news, uh, which uh, for us is not really very much uh, uh, disturbing, um, considering the um, Yeah, considering what is happening in some of the European countries um, where they have suspended or they have stopped using Oxford, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, for some reasons that are not yet uh, confirmed. In all of these issues, it is to consider benefit uh, versus the risk. And what they have noticed is that they have administered almost 5 million doses of this vaccine collectively in the European countries. And only 30 cases uh, so far have reported this incidence of um, uh, thromboembolic uh, uh, incidences that, that have been reported. And that is really very uh, small compared to even the incidence of the disease itself. So if you look at the, even in non-vaccinated population, the risk is higher or the incidence is higher uh, in the general population than it is even in the vaccinated population. Therefore, that is not an established uh, basis. They are still investigating. Um, they cannot conclusively say that um, the thromboembolic attacks are due to uh, the effect of, of the vaccination. Um, so it is something that is given the world some little concern, but for the scientific world, I think it is uh, something not to worry about. For us in Nigeria, we will continue to administer these vaccines. Um, our documentation so far has shown that it is safe to use and um, we will continue to roll out uh, this uh, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccination. However, we will continue to monitor people for symptoms. Any person who has received this vaccine and has some symptoms should please use the MedApp uh, application and report the symptoms. Our staff and uh, the state governments are also trained to monitor and report on these sim the symptoms um, and any untoward side effect that, that has been reported. So it is something that we'll continue to monitor closely. We'll continue to document uh, the findings and we'll continue to provide the public with the general information. If we have any information or if we have any uh, established fact that uh, something is, is wrong or something is not good for the general public, uh, the government will not hesitate uh, to, to take the necessary actions. You know, some of the uh, uh, people who spoke to us yesterday when they heard this part of information uh, from those countries that I've held on was that they said they, the communication they got from government was that, look, it's perfect. They didn't even think that there was any side effect, either one or two percent, until maybe they heard this piece of information. And the news is just uh, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, they suspended this AstraZeneca COVID shots. And the report there says after blood clots were reported. And so, in fact, there was a case that there was a death recorded, and so they had to just hold on. So that is the information that came through as of yesterday. Yeah, that, that, is, that is correct. And um, uh, I think they did take that position. They mentioned it is a precautionary measure. It is not an established fact that the vaccine is associated 
with that uh, thromboembolic attack or what you call the clot uh, formation. Um, <clears throat> they are still doing some investigation, but they provided a clear statement that the incidence of blood uh, clot uh, disease or the thromboembolic disease in the general population in Europe is higher than what was found in the population that has been vaccinated. So that is to tell you clearly that the vaccine itself is not a risk for having thromboembolic attack. Epidemiologically, we know that. However, uh, it is a source of concern if um, some people have reported that symptoms and it needs to be evaluated. And not only is the vaccine being um, administered in Europe, but all other countries, over 50 countries now, that are administering Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine um, have been awakened and will continue to report their findings so that we'll have a global data to fall back on to say that not only in Europe, but in all of these other countries, these are the symptoms and side effects that, that we are noticing. And it is based on that that any scientific decision uh, can be taken. But for now, their action is precautionary. Um, it is not based on a cause-effect relationship um, and that uh, uh, there is no established fact to show that vaccination with this particular vaccine or even with the batch of the vaccine that they are talking about um, has a higher risk than um, in people who are vaccinated with other, other vaccines or not vaccinated at all. Okay, uh, Dr. Riyad Mohamed, what do you think of this? Yeah, um, thank you and good morning, everyone. I, I would like to start with... Uh, the issue that, you know, all drugs truly really have uh, side effects, um, similar to immunization and vaccinations. So this is really not an unexpected event. Uh, all, uh, all drugs and immunizations do have side effects. But, you know, the reason why Denmark suspended its vaccination at the moment is, is it's trying to assess the causality or the relationship between these occurring events in the country and the vaccination holding on at the moment. So it is not really a, a new scenario per se, but uh, it's good to understand that, you know, all drugs and new, the new programs, yeah, pharmacovigilant aspects of, of um, uh, regulatory bodies has to look into some of these events to see whether it is truly associated with the vaccination or it is a, 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 a coincident event. Uh, you know, looking at the country, uh, the risk of population in the country is truly high, even without immunization. So, but then the, the regulatory bodies may want to look into the, uh, the immunization program to see whether there is a causality relationship between, between these occurring events and the ongoing um, COVID-19 vaccination. So I think I will say that uh, it is not an unexpected scenario in the sense that the country has the mandate to investigate and, and find if the, there is truly a positive causality relationship between the event and the, between the immunization and the occurring events. Thank you and over. Yeah. Well, it, it, we'll have to call the names in full all the time because both of you are Dr. Mohammed. So, um, Dr. Tam Mohammed, um, uh, what we are aware of from the NPHCDA is that the batch number of the, the, the COVID-19 that is said to be problematic is different from our own. That one is labeled as uh, 5,300. Uh, could you, do you have any idea what batch we collected. What's the batch number that we collected? Perhaps that will make people feel safer. To name, but um, yesterday when the event uh, uh, was reported, um, I discussed with uh, the ED on, EP, on uh, NPHCDA. Uh, certainly, it is not. We did not receive the same uh, batch as the ones that are implicated now, or the ones that are being investigated in in Europe. Um, we received a completely different batch uh, here in Nigeria. And you saw, as you are aware, also immediately this vaccine arrived. Um, NAFDAQ took a sample of this uh, vaccine, the different batches that arrived, and also do their due diligence to ensure that uh, the vaccine is safe and also the content or the ingredients of the vaccine are exactly what is mentioned to be in the document. Right. 
I, I think it would be quite important to also maybe issue a rejoinder and say, well, this is the batch we got in Nigeria, such that people can know. But yeah, uh, would we'll expect that clearly. But in terms of side effects, because I mean, both of you have said drugs usually have side effects. People react differently, and I want to believe that we've been gathering data. Uh, on those who have uh, been administered uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine in Nigeria. So what have you found out specifically uh, for Nigerians who have gotten these vaccines so far? What kind of side effects did they show? Is it headache? Is it mild pain? Just so people can know the kind of you know, information you have. Because you also said earlier uh, that it's important to give Nigerians general information, really, about what is going on. So what are those side effects you have noticed so far? Okay, so um, certainly um, looking at the strategic leadership now that has taken the vaccine, um, who have not administered um, so many doses, mostly now it is the strategic leadership. Uh, if you look at the uh, Abuja, the Honorable Ministers, uh, His Excellency, Mr. President and Vice President, uh, members of the PTF, uh, some healthcare staff, uh, you know, in some locations in FCT. So the side effects generally are, are the same. Um, the first one is uh, not really a side effect, but really is an effect of the injection itself, which is you have some pain in the site, which can persist for a few hours to maybe a few days. Uh, you will have that pain. And that is just experience, not with this vaccine, but with any other uh, intramuscular vaccination uh, that is done. The second one is also uh, the side effect of injecting a foreign body, particularly if it contains some protein into the body. It can elicit fever. Uh, you can have some mild grade uh, fever, uh, the general feeling of unwell, uh, headache, uh, it can affect maybe your sleep pattern, uh, but they are all mild, mild feelings. Um, specifically, you know, uh, when we looked at who were shared experiences, you know, among the uh, ministers, you know, most of them is, is just some mild fever, uh, headache, and then, um, uh, you know, uh, the general feeling of unwell. But we know that some of the side effects will include mild symptoms of the disease itself. That is, you can have uh, cold, common cold or flu symptoms, uh, sneezing, running nose, and sometimes with, with some little cough. But the important thing is that these symptoms should not persist. They should not exceed more than 24 to 48 hours. And we have also everyone who has been uh, immunized or who has received this vaccination um, has been told to report any symptoms um, that persist, you know, for more than 24 hours. So generally when this, uh, when you take this vaccination, um, we will watch you immediately for at least 15 to 20 minutes, at least to make sure that you don't have any uh, adverse effect. And what we fear most, you know, is what we call anaphylactic shock. That is, you introduce an injection or, you know, uh, something into somebody's body and he goes into shock. And that happens within a very short time. That has not been reported at all. Um, uh, but these symptoms, you know, are symptoms that will go away by themselves, or maybe you just take some small uh, paracetamol, uh, you know, that, that, that will make them go away. So Nigerians should be aware that if you take this uh, vaccination, it is likely that some people will have these very mild symptoms. But if the symptoms persist, or if someone has concern about them, uh, they should not hesitate to report. Uh, these symptoms, because that is the only way that uh, we will scientifically gather the information about the side effects of this vaccination. So I, I imagine that just less than 100 people have gotten this vaccine so far. By the way, that's it for you, Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed. Uh, so how many people have reported symptoms persisting? You say if it persists for beyond 24 or 48 hours. So out of the less than 100 that have been vaccinated, how many people reported you know, persistence symptoms. So these symptoms are, are now reported at the, at the state level. Um, so far, I'm not aware of um, any person who has uh, reported any adverse event uh, that has persisted for more than 24 hours. Uh, but my information may not be up to date because NPHCDA is the one closely tracking that information. As of last uh, yesterday evening, I'm not aware that has not been reported. 
Um, and so we, we can say that um, of the few Nigerians that have been vaccinated now, um, none uh, of the persons has reported a severe or a major uh, side effect of concern. Well, let me, uh, let's go back to uh, Dr. Riyad Mohammed now. Um, this information from Europe is coming at the same time we received the Africa CDC report on, on vaccine perceptions uh, survey. And one of those things, you know, uh, says that 60% uh, of people surveyed believe that COVID-19 vaccine is unsafe. And then we have this information. How does this strike you? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think I must say that um, uh, to us health personnel, it is uh, really not an unexpected finding. If you look at the trend generally, you know, the perceptions of the public perception on what the COVID and this vaccination is uh, really an undesired kind of uh, perception. Um, the, in the beginning, even the whole COVID-19, people try to associate it as a scam. And uh, over, over time, the trend, the trend came down and uh, people somehow accepted it as a new normal. So it's not really an, uh, an unexpected finding that, you know, even the vaccine itself, controversies will come around it. Mm. So I think this is, uh, this is really an, a, kind of, um, a finding that is really not an unexpected finding. But to say the, to say the fact, um, uh, the, the general hesitancy of vaccines will, will cause a setback in trying to to acquire the herd immunity. So that is to say that we really need to do more in terms of public awareness and uh, um, campaigns so that we can we can try to to enlighten people on the need of this vaccination. So generally people tend to associate this vaccine and even the COVID to a kind of um, a kind of scam in the country, uh, the reason being either to get fund from somewhere or try to, or other factors that the population think is um, related to population control or kind of a, 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 a kind of a conspiracy against the, against our population. So the, but then the fact that this, this uh, finding of African cities is coming at this time when there is uh, when there is a uh, suspension of vaccination, vaccination in other countries will, will really have an impact in the overall acceptance of, of the vaccination in, 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 well, our, in this country. Well, Dr. Mohammed, you know, I think you may need to expatiate a little more on this information, dissemination, awareness, and perhaps communication of this. Because take a look at this. In that same report, we have it that more than half of respondents surveyed feel that the threat from coronavirus is exaggerated and that it therefore does not pose as great a risk as some have suggested. This opinion was particularly prevalent in countries such as Nigeria. 67% of people surveyed believe this. So if this has been on, and by the way, of course, you know that this report came, you know, what, this survey was conducted in the middle of last year before now when we are having this report, this opinion about the vaccine. So what else has government not done that ought to be done so that people can uh, take this vaccine and we can achieve this herd immunity you just talked about? Yeah, I think uh, government, government in, on its own is trying its best. Its best. But if, if you look at the general, if you look at the population of understanding of some of these things in our, our part of the country, you will understand that we, need, we really need to do a lot. We may need to do more. Um, thinking of it in or the way forward, I think government must have in place all the means through which population can be enlightened, just like we're doing, doing now. Now, you know, media enlightenment is very important. Via, via radio, via, via video and all that, because a lot of People uh, tend to to listen and, and listen to um, the video, uh, the media, and all that. But then, 
one-on-one -on -one discussion, group discussion, meeting with traditional traditional leaders, religious leaders to involve them in, in disseminating this information is very vital uh, in this, to, to the success of this uh, campaign. So the government, I think, need to do is doing is is doing some it is doing a lot, but maybe there is more need to be done. Both both the government, uh, both particular individuals, both the hospitals, both the traditional institution stakeholders. So all of us have, have to come out, come as one to try to create this public um, awareness and public enlightenment. Well, Dr. Mukta, uh, this report uh, it really underscores this vaccine hesitancy because if 60% of the people are saying, yes, we trust that COVID vaccine is safe, and 59% say, no, we strongly disagree, it is not safe. And that's, that makes your job a lot more challenging. How is, how, how is government going to be approaching this now? Yeah, certainly. So um, let me first address the issue of uh, perception uh, surveys. Uh, perception of people, our experience with uh, surveys on perception um, is that people tend to over-exaggerate or go to the extreme uh, of responses. That may not be the true finding, you know, in, in, in reality. So the question asked is, um, do you think that uh, the, the response or the COVID-19 uh, response, you know, is uh, um, important or something similar to that. So uh, the kind of response we get is people usually go to the extreme. You hardly find people staying in the middle uh, of the ground. Now, it is a challenge in the sense that um, this new information that is coming now is coming at a time when um, vaccine hesitancy um, is uh, getting momentum or whatever in, in, in the country. Uh, we have started with the strategic leadership and people are accepting the vaccines. So negative news like this will definitely adversely affect the efforts of, of, of government and uh, what is happening now. So certainly we have to really buckle up and uh, we have to intensify our campaign and try to enlighten the public uh, for them to understand that all issues of concerns um, you know, are properly addressed by the government and to give assurance, uh, you know, of the safety of, of this vaccine. But we're not just giving a blanket safety uh, assurance. We have to look at the fact. We have to look at the figures. We have to look at the numbers that are being reported regarding the side events and also uh, communicate same uh, to the public. So uh, it is important, um, you know, to continue this sensitization, to continue to engage the public and um, provide all the information that is required out there so that people have informed decisions, so that people are properly aware of what is going on. And then that way you realize that people will dispel any fake news or any uh, conspiracy theory that is out there. All right, we'll take a look at uh, some more of this data and perhaps some questions that people are concerned about uh, when we return for both of you in just a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Well, Dr. Motar, let's take a look at some more of this data, uh, which was put out as well. It says 64% um, of the respondents did mention TV as one of their most trusted sources for information about COVID-19, followed by radio, 51%, online sources, 41%, health bodies, 23%, and government sources, 18%. It means that, uh, well, look... I know you say that they usually go to the extreme. Is this one equally on the extreme? Well, uh, Ch Ch Chamberlain, um, if you look at the data, who is providing the information on the, on the television? Um, who is providing information on the social media? Who is pro so if you look at these uh, uh, answers that we call, they are not mutually exclusive. If you look at the percentages, you can see that they overlap. And that means that people are referring to multiple uh, sources. Yes, um, if you look at uh, what the government is doing, a lot of it is being televised. You look at the activities of the presidential task force. Um, they were having daily briefings. Um, now it is reduced to weekly briefing. At least that is covered live, uh, you know, by 
television channels, including uh, yours. If you look at appearances in, in the radio programs, I think not only in Abuja, but also the states, if you look at the efforts the state governments are doing. So this 18% really is buried in all the others uh, that you have seen in the response. So for us, you know, when interpreting this data, we know that looking at the percentages that have over, overlapped, we know that um, it means that they are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so give us your own picture then. What is government working with in terms of data or degradation or perception about vaccine hesitancy so you know how to proceed with it for those who are naysayers? So actually for, for us, we, 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 we used to look at the data on a weekly basis. Um, we were having what is called the NOI polls and we were getting reports from uh, most of the states and we were monitoring the trend uh, over time. This has now been, been continued and the picture that we are seeing is not different from uh, the results we have on this Africa CDC uh, survey. Uh, the good thing to say is that we have seen an improved uh, awareness, we have seen uh, more positive acceptance of the response and also of the vaccination. Uh, we've also seen um, a greater uh, friendliness uh, towards the response and uh, the measures that the government has taken. So the government will continue to engage the media, will continue to engage uh, important stakeholders and opinion leaders. Um, we are meeting with traditional rulers, we are meeting with religious leaders, and they are all providing information uh, to the public. We are also engaging key opinion leaders in communities. With this vaccination drive, you know, each state government is also setting up its own risk communication structure, where they engage the communities, they engage the gatekeepers, and they make sure that uh, people are aware of the exercise and that um, the information is disseminated properly. Okay. Uh, well, Dr. Riyad, let me just quickly bring this to you. There's, there's so much data to, to look at here, but uh, still referring back to the cases we saw uh, in Europe, or there you see, um, you see top five most common reasons given for not wanting to take a new COVID-19 vaccine. You see, top on that list is I do not trust the COVID-19 vaccine. That's from a survey of Africa CDC. The second one is, I do not believe that the virus exists. I mean, we've seen skeptics time and again. And then the third, I am concerned about the safety of the vaccine. And the fifth one, I do not have sufficient information to make a decision. And, you know, these are some of the major reasons. People say, well, I, I think I'm going to pass on this one. I mean, uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, has largely talked about the data the government is working with, how government, you know, tries to put out information out there. But I just quickly want to uh, touch on the cases we have seen in Europe. That's for Dr. Riyad uh, Mohammed. I know this might be a challenge, but this is for Dr. <laughs> Riyad. Okay. So uh, quickly on, on, the, on the on the cases we've seen in Europe, talking about blood clots, coagulation, and, and all that. Just how uh, regular do you find those cases? Uh, because some are saying that this might not even be related to the vaccine. So just how much do you find these cases in people normally uh, and then for people who have taken the vaccine? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, the, the incidence of blood clots that has been found in, in Europe that led to the suspension of the vaccine. Looking at the data, over 11 million uh, jabs have been given. Meaning 11 million of their population have been given a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine. But looking at the data, I think it's about 50 personnel that, are, that got that uh, presented with, with this clothing problem. And, uh, but the fact that one, of, one nurse died as a result of coagulation, that was the reason why they had to suspend and do a causality assessment to find out if there is really a relationship between this, high, this rising incidence of coagulation and COVID-19 vaccination, which is, which is normal for every country um, implementing this COVID-19 vaccination. They have to set surveillance in place so that they look at what the common occurrences of any event. And then if there are high rising cases of, of any event, then the country has that uh, mandate to do a causality assessment to find whether there is any causal relationship between the two. So, but looking at Denmark now, you know, 50 in, one, in 11 million is not really that high a figure because the common disease of that country, common disease entity of that country 
of that country is uh, more of chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and all of that. So the risk of coagulopathies or coagulatory diseases is really high among that population, not like the population we have in Africa and all that. So their normal incidence um, is really all up to that level. I have not calculated the uh, the incidence the incidence of um, the cases they had, but I think it's about, it's about 50 pers persons that, that reported coagulation problem, uh, coagulopathy problem. And um, I think the, the, the reg regulatory body ha had to suspend it to do a causality assessment. But then, at the moment now, there is no link that that uh, it is the COVID-19 vaccination that caused, the, that caused the bleeding and the population problem. So I think we, you know, the suspension is for two weeks so that the country can conduct a, an assessment to see whether there is a relationship. But it's, it's, it's a fact that we should all know that uh, Denmark, among some of their um, um, medical, dis um, some of their diseases, coagulopathies uh, is really high in that country. Right. Thank you, Anuba. Okay, so Dr. Mukhtar, I mean, when this news hit, there were a lot of people, maybe skeptics, especially, you know, putting out messages saying, I told you so, and this is what I was telling you about the vaccine. And naturally, they wanted to hear the government say, we will suspend, you know, vaccination process while we look into these, you know, figures. But it seems the government is saying, well, we're going the way of the UK, Spain, and even France who say they are continuing uh, with this rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine particularly. So in terms of protection, just to put out the information, uh, just how much um, protection would this vaccine provide? Because for some other people, they were thinking, uh, uh, maybe not the AstraZeneca, I'll probably go with the Pfizer. And that was a bone of contention for them. So help people understand just the level of protection this might offer. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, you are right, uh, some of the skeptics, and, and that's why we are not happy, uh, because it is coming at a time when uh, the vaccination drive in Nigeria is gaining momentum. Um, and of course, we know that we have the skeptics, people who have expressed doubt, uh, people who come out you know, to publicly mention um, why are we making this choice of even AstraZeneca? Why not other vaccines? Um, certainly, it will, it will set us back a little. But it is gratifying for us to know that based on the data we have, based on the evidence uh, that is before us, we do not have any serious concern. We do not have any concern at all, you know, to halt, uh, to ponder, or to even, um, uh, you know, uh, suspend the use of this, of this vaccine. What we'll continue to do is to intensify our effort at surveillance, to encourage people to report any of these uh, symptoms that they have observed, and we'll measure it to see what are the adverse uh, events that are of interest or that are, you know, um, uh, we consider high risk that will need to be looked at in more detail. Um, and again, let me just reiterate what my brother, Dr. Riyad, uh, mentioned, you know, uh, regarding what happened in Europe. Um, the incidence of this thromboembolic disease, what you call the blood clotting uh, disease, among people who are vaccinated is less than the incidence of the thromboembolic disease in the general population. So that is to tell you that even based on the data they have, it is not uh, a risk at all. But they have said they are suspending for some time and they really want to uh, perform a more rigorous uh, exercise to ensure that you know um, uh, the statement is, is verified and they will continue with their vaccination. So for Nigeria, I would want to encourage the public. Yes, we know that um, there are a lot of skepticism. Um, we know that the whole COVID exercise, not only in Nigeria, but globally, um, we have people who have expressed doubts. We have a lot of fake news uh, that is filtering from any source. And people that are uh, originating this, you know, will now post back and tell people, well, we told you so. We suspected this. And this include very, um, uh, some prominent people and some important uh, you know, uh, media or, you know, organizations that have a very large reach. So we will continue to tackle them. We'll continue to address the issues. Uh, right. Regarding so the NOI polls also, 
um, we will target these responses. We will look at the reasons why people are not uh, skeptical, they are skeptical or they are not taking the vaccine. We'll address all of these reasons programmatically. We'll try to target the population and we'll try to provide them with the necessary fact and information so that they will be better informed. But okay, Doctor, as we wind down now, what is uh, what's going to be done or how will you approach, for instance, if Kogi says, I'm not going to take the vaccine and I'm not going to receive it, what happens? Now, the vaccine, if you look at it, the rollout, nobody is being forced to take the vaccine. Um, it is willingly, it is when you understand, when you understand the benefit outweighs the risk, that is when you go forward and you collect uh, your vaccination. We'll continue to provide the information out there. We'll continue to counter any fake news or any reasons people might have or any reasons that uh, necessitate this vaccine hesitancy. We will address them. And I know that Nigerians are very reasonable. People will look at the fact, they will look at the evidence, and they will look at the information. Uh, particularly health workers and uh, important community influencers, it's important we measure what we mention to the public. If we do not have any verified information, I think it will be very counterproductive for us to mount a podium or to use a media uh, avenue or channel and provide fake inf information so, to our public. So, so we why, why? continue you know, to provide yeah. the right information so that pe people make that informed decision. By so if, it's, um, if you're not forcing people to do it, why is government then saying that uh, if people don't get vaccinated, they won't fly, they won't be able to travel? Well, this is, this is not our own making, but we're all making a projection. Because, you see, when you look at what is happening, the trend that is going on globally, uh, you realize that in not far uh, future, you know, um, such restrictions will come uh, into being. Um, it's about public good. It's about public safety. Uh, take, for example, um, people going for international sports festival or even religious uh, duties such as going on pilgrimage. You know, the receiving countries will have to be very careful. They will have to be very uh, prudent to ensure that people do not bring new infections to them, people do not bring uh, variants, you know, of COVID-19 that, you know, will devastate or reverse the gains that they have made. So it is just a common uh, reason that you will say, yes, uh, that is the direction where the world is going. And um, people without vaccination certificate may not be allowed to fly or to go to uh, other countries. Right now, we have seen it. Almost all the countries are requiring uh, people going into their countries to have a COVID uh, negative result. It's just a safety measure that any responsible government will take to protect its population. Well, isn't it premature? Because, I mean, we've got two years. That's the timeline government has given. We received less than four million. You're targeting there's 80 more million expected, and then the population to vaccinate is huge. So we can meet up, uh, because if that kicks in immediately, or when is that going to kick in, by the way? Maybe I should start with that. So um, the number of vaccines that we're expecting is being worked out. No, I, I'm uh, sorry. I mean, right now, the, uh, this Minister policy of, of government, the national primary health pardon me, let me correct that. Agency. I mean, when you say that uh, people this... can't travel, when is that supposed to kick in? Uh, we don't know. We, we can't say. But it is, that is why the countries, everyone is racing towards vaccinating its people. Uh, because as we see with this vaccine politics or the vaccine nationalism, we see that the developed countries have uh, taken and kept uh, the vaccines to themselves. And the purpose, what we can uh, allude from here, is to say that they are trying to vaccinate as many people uh, of their population as they can. And if they do that, they will be afraid, you know, to have any new importations of cases into their country. And that is why we also have to expand our drive. We also have to, uh, to compete to make sure that within a reasonable time frame, we're able to achieve that herd immunity. Because without it, we know that um, some of these countries will not allow 
uh, Nigerians, you know, to travel to their countries. So we are looking at really the rollout between now and uh, end of 2022. Um, we have received this four million. Hopefully in the next uh, few weeks, we expect uh, some additional uh, maybe 18 million from the same source and also an additional 16 million from, from a different source. We are not going to restrict ourselves to just using the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine um, because in this, uh, th there is really an advantage of um, using uh, different vaccines so that you can fight the different strains. Uh, you know, that are coming. And even the vaccines themselves will continue to be modified, you know, to address uh, this issue of the new variants. All right, and Dr. Mukhtar Mohammed, National Incident Manager, PTF on COVID-19, as well as Dr. Riyad Mohammed, a field epidemiologist. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Chamberlain. Thank you for having us. All right, and we're back in a moment. Stay with us.